This comes to us from the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine, where he's an assistant clinical professor of community and family medicine and a founder of the Institute for International Medicine, where he's also a full-time volunteer. Prior to his current position, he served inner city citizens for a year at Shanghai Charity Hospital during the pre-posterity era in China. And over a two-year period, initiated a healthcare ministry in the war besieged city of Wambo during the war years in Angola in southern Africa. He also served one month medical assignments in Honduras, Haiti, Zimbabwe, Burkina Faso, Niger, and Kuming in China. He then worked for six years in the Kansas City Public Hospital Systems before launching INMED, that is the International Medicine Institute, in 2003. Dr. Cominales attended the University of Missouri Kansas City School of Medicine, the St. Louis University School of Public Health, and was a family medicine resident at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and John Peter Smith Hospital in Fort Worth, Texas. He also earned a diploma in tropical medicine from the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. He's a board certified in both preventive medicine and family medicine, and is the author of INMED, International Medicine and Public Health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cominalis to EIU. I uh, sure enjoyed the chance to come up and, and visit all of you. I think the snow was uh, <laughs> One something we were none of us were expecting this morning. There we go. We'll keep the record people happy. Well, what I want to do in the next hour or so, a little less than an hour, right, is to talk about some highlights of health problems in the world's poorest communities and some effective strategies to uh, make that improved. But I want to begin a little bit with uh, my own story, and it started with a biography. I believe very strongly in the power of role models. Give someone a role model, a positive role model that they can follow, and it will often ignite the career of many people. So, Deliver Us From Evil, Tom Dooley was the author. He was the St. Louis physician who was in charge of the refugee camp between North and South Vietnam. Uh, at the outbreak of the war. And uh, reading his, his account of, of compassion on these people who were in utter fear uh, set the tone for, uh, for the rest of my life. And so as I progressed through my education, I was looking for opportunities to, uh, to test out this, this inspiration that I had received from, from Tom Dooley. And it began at, at a maternity hospital in Haiti where we, had, we were delivering babies, they were delivering babies, but they had no gloves. And women were bleeding, but they had no gauze. And newborns were having trouble, but they didn't have a bag and mask to help the babies breathe. And it was a heart-wrenching experience of, of how do you do healthcare in a very low resource setting without the most elementary things. And uh, that, that tone I carried a little bit further. So uh, as I, as I progressed through education. I, I worked at the uh, clinic at Evangelica Morava on the eastern seaboard of Honduras. Anybody been to Honduras? Now Honduras, of course, is like most nations, is, is quite a mix. There are, there are Latino people and then there are indigenous people. And uh, the indigenous people tend to be poorer and tend to live further out in the rural communities. Um, and as we cared for them, we had a few more resources. And so, so when, I, when I delivered babies, uh, we actually did have gauze and, and did have gloves. And there was a little bit more hopeful experience in that. Well, as a, as a resident physician, I took a, a stint in Burkina Faso, West Africa. And I had a lot to learn, exemplified by, by this child. So he came in with these, with these lumps on his head and, and his mom said, well, these are, these are sort of painful and they're getting bigger. And um, is there anything you can do about that? Well, and I, I thought to myself, oh, I've seen this before. You know, he has a little skin abscess, right? You know, a little 
And uh, so what we need to do is to make a, a little incision and let the pus drain out. And so I numbed him up and, and uh, made a little cut there and had the surprise of my life because what came out was not actually infection or pus. It was a, it was a big white worm. Oh my gosh, yeah. And you, you may have heard of river blindness. Sometimes it's called night blindness. It's very prominent in West Africa. And it's caused by a microfilaria, a tiny, tiny parasite. And uh, in this big white worm was the adult mother that produces the, the small worms that cause blindness in, in children and, and adults alike. Well, following that, I took an assignment at the, uh, sh at the charity hospital in Shanghai. Now, we think of, of China as this wonderful economic powerhouse, and, and much of it is. But there are, are pockets of poverty in, in China that are just as deep as, as anywhere in uh, Africa or Latin America. And so as we cared for people, um, we saw a, a lot of tuberculosis, you know? T TB, the leading cause of death in the United States 100 years ago, um, was still afflicting these low-income people in, in Shanghai. I finished up my, my tour there, and I moved to Angola in southern Africa. Now, you all know where Angola is located, don't you? So when you, when you look at a map of Africa, Africa looks very much like this. So you've got, got Kenya and Uganda and South Africa at the feet, and Angola is actually the right knee of the continent of Africa. A Angola had the misfortune of being known for the longest running civil war in African history. Uh, it had been going on for, for 35 years. Imagine an entire nation that had no open schools, no maintained roads, no postal service, no banking, no law enforcement, and landmines everywhere. Um, Princess Di, just before she died, was in Angola to highlight the fact that Angola had more landmines per capita than any other nation in the world. 350 landmines per citizen. Oh my gosh, yeah. So it, it was the best example of social chaos that I can, can think of, at least in, in personal experience. Well, the war escalated and I returned to Kansas City where I started the Institute for International Medicine with the idea of there are many well-meaning people. Um, sometimes they're medical professionals, but oftentimes they are anthropologists, administrators, public health leaders, uh, people in physical therapy and nursing that have a very deep heart to do something significant on behalf of the world's most forgotten. Uh, but there's a process to getting there, and that's what we're all about, is filling in that process. Well, I'm going to mention some statistics to you, but I want to start with the most basic health statistic that there is. So, women do live longer than men, and, and there are some reasons for that. You see, guys are all about innovation. You know, you give us some duct tape, and some WD-40, and, and we can fix things, you know? We, do you see women doing anything like this? No, I mean, they're, they're, uh, they're gonna be more careful um, than guys, and you wonder why guys don't live as long as, as women do. Yeah, what are they thinking? And now, this can start very early. You may see this, if you have children, you may see this in your children, you may see this in your nephews, that, uh, they want to just fix it, whatever it takes. Now this one's sort of shocking. Yeah, okay. And all of this has been going on for a very, very long time. Men innovating at the risk of their lives. Oh, what were they thinking? Well, I, I have a, a a little video from Braveheart, which isn't working, but you all remember his great speech when they are uh, in front of the, the, the king's army, and he has his little ragtag team of, of people that are supposed to do something to defend uh, their nation. There's it is human nature to stand up to a challenge, whether it is leaves falling out of the back of a truck um, or protecting the world's most marginalized people. 
we have to choose what challenge, though, that we're going to focus on. It is a big world, and you can't do everything. Uh, it is human nature to defend, but we have to make some decisions about who exactly we're going to defend if we're going to have some impact. And I think all of you are here because you have a very deep motivation to, to not only learn about uh, diverse cultures, but also to be engaged with them. And so in particular, if we look at the world's most impoverished communities, well, it's, it's second nature to think of Southern Africa, Southern Asia as being the, the regions of great poverty. When we, when we define poverty, what do we usually mean? All right. Economic production. OK. Income low. OK, no food or water. Yeah, and, and I'm going to explore with you some, some definitions of poverty that, that may go a little bit beyond that. Of course, poverty is not confined to poor nations. There are pockets of poverty within our wealthy nation. Uh, this illustration shows counties in the US in which people, more than two thirds of the people, live below the poverty line by our unit US definition, which for a family of four is something like 21,000 a year. Can you imagine managing a family on $21,000 a year? Extremely difficult. So there are pockets of poverty all over the United States. When you think of those kind of individuals, what do they tend to have in common? All right, they may be homeless or marginally housed. Mm -hmm. Single Certainly. Oh, excellent. Yes. No mm -hmm. Lack of money. And sure. Okay. Oh, excellent. That's very profound. Yeah. Often true. Yes. There are more. Yes, please. Oh yeah, certainly, for the, for the benefit of the videographer. Yeah, when we think of people that are living on the margins in the United States, they're often undereducated, unemployed, underhoused. They're also often non-English speakers, or English is their second language. You know, they may be identified as an immigrant or a refugee um, within, our, within our context. Well, back to quality of life or poverty. Are, are there any other measures that you might want to include when you consider a definition of poverty? Access to basic health care. Okay, access to basic health care. Life expectancy is a, a useful measure, one that we can actually put a number on. Illiteracy. What's that? Illiteracy. Illiteracy, yes. Literacy is very tightly correlated with, with life expectancy and of certainly with income. Uh, so literacy is a reflection of, of education and job opportunities. Well, there are various well-developed quality of life indices. The, the Human Development Index is the one that we're going to, to focus on mostly, but there are some others. The Quality of Life Index um, mentions some of the parameters that, that, you just, that you just said. It includes not only hard numbers like life expectancy, but also things like, like social relationships. Are people part of a group? Are they part of a church or a civic organization or a union or a political movement as a, a sign of wealth? Political stability. You know, if Angola is probably zero and some other nations would, would rate much higher in terms of, of political stability. Family stability, you know. More parameters. Job security, what's the unemployment rate? Gender equality, if you can put a number on that, um, certainly is correlated with, with a degree of prosperity. Well, using this kind of criteria, what nations do you suppose have the very best quality of life? Northern Europe, all right. Scandinavian countries. Who else comes to mind? Okay, Australia. Canada does quite well, yes. Anywhere in Asia? Japan. 
Japan, okay. Japan, Singapore. Yeah, South Korea is doing pretty well. Well, if, if you look at the numbers, you are indeed correct. Life in Northern, uh, Northern Europe is, is pretty good. And, and it's interesting, you know, we have uh, St. Patrick's Day, and they have a lot to celebrate in terms of uh, these quality of life parameters. And Australia did make the list. Iceland. We often don't think of, of life in Iceland, but... All right, well, let's turn it around and consider the worst quality of life nations on Earth. Who comes to mind? Okay, Angola. Haiti, Somalia, Congo, Zambia, okay, Latin America, mm, Laos, yeah, yeah, North Korea. Well, it's the, the worst quality of life in the whole world. Oh my goodness. Well, suddenly we're, there's all this attention on West Africa. Now, when was the last time that, that Senegal uh, and Liberia made, made the news. Yeah, I ha hasten to say that one of the advantages of the current epidemic is that it's focused the, the world's attention on some of the most impoverished regions of the entire planet. Now, to put it in perspective, and I'm going to share it just opinion here, <coughs> how many people have died of this disease? Ebola. Yeah. Something like 2,000, maybe 3,000. Of course, we'll never know exactly. Every year, a quarter million children die of measles. Now, measles, a disease for which we have a reliable vaccine and we have reliable tr treatment options. Where is the outrage? over a quarter million kids dying of a disease that we can prevent and treat. Now, I'm very sorry for the people that have died of Ebola, um, but I think perspective is very important. There's a hundred times as many people dying of, uh, of preventable illnesses. Well, worst quality of life. Are there any surprises on this list? Botswana, Russia are made the list. Nigeria has tremendous resources. They've got oil. It's one of the more, I've always thought one of the more prosperous countries in Africa. Yeah, Nigeria makes the list in spite of its oil resources. And look at all the stands, the former Soviet republics. Uh, to me, this is the, the forgotten region of the world. You know, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan. Vast regions of, uh, of, of, our, of, our, of our planet over which there is extremely little interest and extremely little investment. And if this scale goes to 10. Yes. And of course, the very worst, um, Haiti and Zimbabwe. We'll talk a little bit more about in a, in a moment. So here's a question for you. Physical health and economic development are very closely tied together. All of these are true as economies grow, health grows, except one. Which statement is not true? Yeah, D, exactly. What, what happens to, to childbirth as economies grow? It goes down. And, and why do you suppose? What, what, Okay, access to contraception, reproductive health care. Excellent. Don't need kids to work. People are focused on their jobs instead of raising children. Yes. Child mortality goes way down as the number of children goes down. So does the health of those children go up. And as a... <laughs> Young women can do other things than stay home and have babies, right? They can travel, they can get a job, they can go to school. Uh, one of the most dynamic examples of this is, is the social transformation that has occurred in Bangladesh, 
Are any of you familiar with that, with that story? So there, there, were, there have been a couple of fires in the garment factories, which, which is awful. But contradiction, contradistinction to that, however, those garment factories have provided lots of options for young women. And where the factories are going up, there are also schools going up, and this, this transformation within the culture of, of Bangladesh where women don't normally marry as teenagers anymore. The, the age of, of marriage and childbirth has been delayed by several years uh, by virtue of the fact that they have alternatives to simply going to work. Well, I'm going to focus on the Human Development Index. Now, this is the one that is used by the United Nations most commonly for their programs. So when we talk about quality of life, uh, they usually frame it in terms of uh, HDI. Anybody familiar with HDI? When you read World Bank reports or WHO reports, uh, they will frequently rate the status of nations or economies according to human development. And they measure only three, only three parameters, um, life expectancy, literacy or education, and income. The, the advan what do you suppose is the advantage of just rating three compared to, to 10 or 15? They don't talk about political stability or gender equality or family stability or social organization, social relationships. Yes. So it's, to repeat then, it is a simplified scale. Uh, it doesn't take into account some of those other important factors of political stability and family relationships that are, are so important. But these are all things that, which we can affix a number to rather readily. And so from a, if we want to objectify our scales, uh, the HDI will help. Well, life expectancy, I'm going to touch on each of these uh, one by one. So if we look at, at life expectancy since 1950, uh, up through the present, then the United States comes in purple at the top. So over the last 60 years, life expectancy has grown from about 70 up to 80. Pretty impressive. Uh, if you look at, at China and Japan, it's gone from about 42 up to 65. You know, life expectancy has grown for over, by 20 years over the last 60. Um, in Asia. That's amazing. People who never even met their grandparents now routinely grow up with their grandparents. Very, very impressive. Well, and then in the light green at the, at the bottom is life expectancy in Southern Africa. So it peaked around 1990 and has been sliding. What, what's the dynamic at play? HIV? HIV? Population control. War. war, there has been a lot of war. Usually it is attributed indeed to, to HIV and people with HIV most commonly die from tuberculosis which is much worse in, in HIV infected people. And the, the wars in southern Africa have certainly contributed to, to that social chaos. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um I know HIV is a huge one, but I don't know what you want to say about malaria as well. Yeah, at eight, the um when you look at the world's poorest nations, uh, malaria comes in at about the fifth leading cause of death and it is usually death among children. Uh, very, very sad. Uh, malaria has unfortunately been rather static. Deaths from malaria have not reduced a whole lot uh, recently, although deaths from HIV have had that, that big spike um, in the 90s and the 2000s. Now, we, we're not as concerned about HIV in the United States because we have these wonderful drugs you know, to treat the disease. But often those drugs are not available. You know, in spite of PETFAR and national efforts to provide HIV treatment to their people, getting it from the capital city in the container out to the individuals 
who uh, are in most in need is, is quite a challenge. Have any of you been involved with HIV work in some of these nations? Yes, Uganda. Yeah, the logistics are often the problem. It's not a lack of, of knowledge or sometimes not even a lack of resources. It's who is actually going to test the person, educate the person, provide the, the medication, the follow-up, the monitoring. It's the logistics that tend to be uh, the greatest challenge. Well, if you, we just look at, at life expectancy uh, on a world map, then green is, is the best life expectancy, and the dark colors are the world's, life expect, uh, the world's, uh, world's worst. Now, uh, now we're going to touch a little bit on, on economic output. Now, this scale shows economic output since 1820. We'll take a big picture of the entire world here. So Western Europe and, um, and the United States come in in blue and purple uh, at the top. So no surprise, economic activity has skyrocketed uh, over the last couple of hundred years. Uh, China is in, the, um, is in the purple. It didn't start until 19, the 1950s, 60s, and of course since 1990 it's grown enormously. And then flat across the bottom in the green is the... Um, economy of southern Africa and most of Asia. Very concerning because economics reflect so many other social parameters. Yes? Excellent question. So Africa is the home of many, many natural resources. And we would expect that with those kind of resources, there would be uh, big advantages for, for local economies. Now, I can only speak authoritatively uh, regarding Angola because I've lived there for several years. Um, but I think it is reflective of much of Africa. So Angola has enormous oil reserves and diamond production. And the U.S. and South African companies are there um, pulling out of those resources. Now, obviously, they are paying. They're paying very well, the Angolan government, you know, for the uh, opportunity to, to use those resources. So the, the government becomes wealthy. And does that money trickle down to the average individual? Well, it has. In the case of Angola, it has a little bit. You know, there are roads where there used to be no roads. And there is a functioning railroad where there used to be no functioning railroad. And everyone has a cell phone, whereas no one used to have a cell phone. Uh, there is no war going on, whereas that was daily life. And there are at least school buildings, even if there aren't teachers. There are buildings now. <laughs> and there are clinic buildings, even if there are no nurses. Uh, so, so yeah, life is a little bit better for the average individual. But it's that, it's that separation between the wealth that is held on, held on to by the government and the distribution to normal individuals that I think is the big roadblock uh, in the case of, of Angola. Um, any comment about Uganda and that development situation? Yes. So in the case of Uganda, over 10 or 15 years, the economic situation has improved. Yeah, and I have great, I have great hope. I think that, that the, with, with the maintaining a, a peaceful political system, that there will continue to be some growth. Well, if we look at, at GDP um, on the world map, so blue is good, red, yellow, are, are poor, but then if we, if we look at it in terms of economic output, the world sort of looks like this. Do you see, um, can you make any generalization about economic productivity in the world? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, very similar. Well, it, the size represents the economic output of the region.
Oh, Japan is a <laughs> continent, yeah. So there is something about Southern Hemisphere that seems to be a generalization here. Now there are, there are a few exceptions. Um, Singapore, oops, Singapore for example, um, is a thriving economy in the Southern Hemisphere, but literacy, the third component. So a person's ability to read is very, very tightly correlated with their income. It's also correlated with whether their children die. So young mothers who cannot read are much more likely to have their children die before starting school. Why would that be the case? How could the mother's literacy be linked to the baby's health? All right. Even if there is someone in that country distributing health care information, then the person, it, it's useless if the person can't read the brochure or, you know, a book, like a textbook, but like a health book for school. Certainly. Yeah, so a, a young mother would, who can read can um, gather health information to protect her child. And so if she gets a, a pamphlet and it talks about hand washing or nutrition for her baby, then that would be a, a more direct application. But on a broader scale, literacy of the mother also influences what other sort of factors that would impact the health of her baby. Nutrition. N nutrition, yeah. Money to, the baby. Money to support the baby. Yeah, now we're getting warm. There you go. And so areas where you have better literacy means you have a more stable political system, more public sector infrastructure to get that literacy rate up. And so people in those situations are less susceptible to income mortality. Yes, so people who, have, who are more literate are more likely to have a better job and are more likely to afford a better house and maybe a house that has safe drinking water and better nutrition, and to be able to afford health care if it's necessary you know, for their baby. So literacy is a, is a reflection of overall economic status as well. Yes? In times past when uh, literacy is not uh, measured by reading, you could say, uh, in times when they are planning to have children, and they have Yes, please. I want to add up that many part of Antonio's market and many part of what we can do today to have a literacy rate, whether I'm using a huge as a standard to measure, because there are some who are very knowledgeable in their yes. local you know, dialect and mm -hmm. language that communicate well. So that's another element of the debate we need to mm -hmm. consider. Yeah, literacy in, in what particular language so can, can be a factor. Uh, you may know that Rwanda nation in southern Africa, um, has recently changed their official language from French to English. <laughs> and uh, you can imagine the, the sort of chaos that might be going on in the education system as they, as they try to uh, make, this, make this transition. Well, up to this point, we've been talking all about a lot of numbers. And what I'd like to do is to put a face on some of these numbers by, by highlighting a, a few individuals that I cared for uh, last summer uh, in Angola. And I want to start with uh, Maria. So her family brought her in because she has this, this pain in her neck. Well, it started with a toothache, and then suddenly she had this rupture and pus draining down the side of her neck. And uh, when I saw her, her blood pressure was low, and she had a, a very high fever. And this was really the only problem that I, that I could identify a, as an infection. Well, over the next day, we, uh, we treated her infection and we treated her low blood pressure and nevertheless, she died. What did she die of? It was an infected tooth. 
Yeah, you know, in the United States, we treat dentistry as if it's this cosmetic, optional thing that you buy if you can afford to, but it's really not essential or life-saving. And yet, every month in Angola, I usually care for three or four people who develop an infected tooth, it goes to an abscess, they get sepsis, and then they die. Dentistry is a life-saving field. And among the, the, the low-income people in the United States, as well as any other place on Earth, you know, there are enormous numbers of people that have infected teeth that are at risk for developing uh, life-threatening infections. Uh, dental care is just as important as medical care or prenatal care or well-child care, uh, something that we need to be, to be advocates for. Well, then there's Marcelo. Uh, he's five years old and his, his parents bring him in uh, because he's been coughing for about a week and he's been losing weight for three months and been having diarrhea. And uh, I'm, I'm holding up his x-ray to the, to the window here. Uh, sort of hard to read? Very hard to read, like a very blurry picture. Uh, but what I'm, what I'm looking at here on his x-ray is, is he has a big white spot in the upper part of his lung that shouldn't be there. It's his pneumonia. It's a child with pneumonia, but not only that, when, when we tested him, he has HIV infection. Now, how does a five-year-old get HIV infection? Yeah, from, from the mother. So if a woman is HIV positive and delivers her baby, there's about a 20% chance that her baby will become infected at the time of delivery. Uh, and then if she nurses her baby, then there's the risk of HIV from the, from the breast milk, and so the risk doubles to about 40%. Now that's without any kind of intervention. And if we can um, offer testing to these pregnant women and treat those who are positive, then the risk of, of their baby getting AIDS you know, goes from like 40% down to about 2%. Extremely life-saving. So children should never develop HIV infection. Um, and in his case, the HIV is what predisposed him to develop pneumonia. And, and we were able to treat his pneumonia and then start treating his, his HIV. And he did re indeed recover. But uh, we need to continue to be vigilant to protect children from HIV. It just, just shouldn't happen. Conventional methods of quantifying indicate about 70% of all children, 70% of all children in the world's poorest communities Die of what? Okay. Diarrhea. All right, so we've got malnutrition, infectious disease, vaccine preventable like measles, uh, respiratory disease, uh, pneumonia. Uh, or injuries. So it's actually an infectious disease of some kind. And it's, and it's the ones we've talked about. It's tuberculosis and pneumonia and diarrhea and uh, measles and malaria are the, big, are the big killers of children. And of course they're all preventable diseases. Now I'm glad you mentioned malnutrition. So malnutrition is never listed as a cause of death. When you, when you look at health statistics for these communities, you know, malnutrition doesn't come up there at all. Why do you suppose? Okay, exactly. That's exactly it. So malnutrition puts them at risk for developing an infection usually. And so when I lived in Africa, my children all had malaria and they all had dysentery and they all recovered because they were nourished people to start with. They had a lot of, of reserve. Uh, but take a child who is, who is profoundly malnourished, it might only take a little bit of, of uh, pneumonia or diarrhea to put them at risk. So that's why malnutrition is not listed as a cause of death. It's usually the thing that takes down a child is some kind of infectious disease. Well, then there's Antonio. Antonio comes and says that I just can't find my way around like I used to. The world is becoming blurry. And uh, he, he isn't able to get outside of his house. He has to have someone help him to go 
to go shopping, to go on a trip. And so I, I take a look in his eyes, and do you see anything concerning? Yeah, so, so the, the pupil is supposed to be black, and his, his is white. So he is suffering from cataracts. You know? Most of you probably have a parent or a grandparent who's had cataracts, and they, they go to the surgeon, and they're in and out in about four hours, and the, the operation actually only takes about 20 minutes you know, in the hands of, of a professional. Uh, cataract surgery is very easy. Uh, and yet, he lives in a region of the world where there are no eye surgeons. And so, the rest of his life, he will be dependent upon someone to lead him around. Now, you, you're probably all familiar with the, the medical missions phenomenon in the United States. You know, every year, there's something like 5,000 teams that are going to other countries for usually a week, maybe two weeks, and doing some kind of medical care. And there's some controversy surrounding all of that. But one of the most effective outcomes um, is eye surgeons going to places like this and taking care of people that have a surgical problem like a cataract that they can fix in just a few minutes and uh, transform the life of, of some individuals. Well, and then finally, um, Marcelo was riding his bicycle. Now, you know, everybody has a bicycle or a, or a small motorcycle. And they're tooling around and the roads are not well maintained and the traffic is horrible sometimes and he fell. Oh, ouch. So I'm holding up his x-ray to the window here and, and this is his thigh. Yeah, that's, that's right. But if, you, if this happened to you and, uh, and they took you down the road to, is it uh, Sarah Bush, right? All right, so there would be a, an orthopedic doctor who would come in and they would, uh, they would put you to sleep and they would put a rod down that bone and the next day you would be walking. Really miraculous um, how they can, can fix injuries like this. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have access to that kind of technology. And so we'll put him in traction. Uh, and he'll, he'll lay in bed with uh, 15 pounds of weight on his leg for the next two months um, until that bone heals. And then he'll start learning how to walk again. Uh, there again, these are, these are things where we have the skill, we have some technology where we could, could be a wonderful benefit uh, to people. But it's barriers of, of economy and culture and distance that, that make it so difficult. Is it painful? Yeah. Well, I, yeah, it does look painful. Actually, after a couple of days, it's not very painful at all. As yes? An EMT, when you have fractures like that, they tell you to, to straighten it, and it actually is more painful until you pull it out. So it's like you feel like there's no pressure on that vein. Yes. On that main vein. So they say when you put that, people they can feel more relief when you're when pulling they pull it out. out. Because there's not that pressure. Okay. Yeah, so uh, EMT experience shows that when you, when you give a little traction on the leg, it helps to relieve the pain. Well, let's come back to forgotten people here in the United States. So often they have these sort of, of elements in mind. Um, but in, there are particular pockets. You know, some of you are involved in refugee care. You know, the United States have, <coughs> has absorbed a large number of, of Afghans and Somalis and Bhutanese. Um, the Bhutanese are ethnical, or they're, they're ethnic Nepali, people from Nepal, who were living in the neighboring nation of Bhutan. Uh, for some reason, Bhutan decided they wanted uh, to ethnically cleanse or purify their country, and they pushed out all of the Nepalese people. Uh, the United States has received a lot of these people. What sort of, of refugee communities do you have in this area? Uh, in, you know, or in this region of southern Illinois? Maybe not much. Okay, They're, they haven't been here yet, <laughs> but it may happen. So, um, people like this who, who have come to the United States, of course, <coughs> usually don't have English, and they don't have a professional skill that, that we would recognize in this country. And it's, a, it's an enormous shock. Um, the process of resettlement is, is fraught with difficulties. And then we have our own Native Americans. We have our own people growing up in this country uh, in 
often in great poverty, um, extremely disadvantaged. We don't know the true number of, of people that are being trafficked uh, in the United States. You know, obviously, they're, they, are, they are hidden, otherwise they would have been rescued. And some of you may be involved in efforts to, to eliminate trafficking um, within the United States. Uh, in recent years, it's been disasters that have highlighted the needs of forgotten people. And so when the earthquake in Haiti occurred, you may have pulled out your phone and text $10 to Red Cross or Doctors Without Borders. Uh, but some of the disasters are, are completely unknown, such as this one in, in Nicaragua. Uh, there was another earthquake in Indonesia that never made the news in the United States. Um, a meningitis epidemic in, in West Africa killed a couple of thousand people. Now, at a university like this, all of our students and have to receive a meningitis vaccine you know, in order to prevent that. Because wherever you have people crowded together, then there's that risk of, uh, of, of such a disease. Uh, vitamin A deficiency. Well, when, it, when you take your multivitamin, there's, there's vitamin A in there. But if you have a healthy diet, then you probably will not never get deficient in, in vitamin A. Unfortunately, kids with, with vitamin A deficiency will go blind. They, they get a thickness of their, their cornea, so they can't see, and, uh, and then they will often die. Why do you suppose a child like this would die? Yeah, well, they, they, of course, you could imagine that you might stumble and hurt yourself and you might become infected. Um, but on a broader scale, someone who is so malnourished that they're vitamin A deficient are probably also not getting enough calories or protein or, or fats in their diet. And they're going to die from one of those other infectious diseases uh, as well. Uh, women dying in, dying in childbirth, you know, very, very rare in the United States. Um, but still, some half a million people are, uh, are delivering their babies and then usually bleeding to death. Um, preventing women from bleeding after, after childbirth is usually not that hard. Um, with, with some very simple drugs and techniques, we can, we can prevent women from, from bleeding to death. And yet, because we don't have that available skill in, in these poorest communities, uh, it's still happening. Chagas disease is, is one of those tropical medicine things that is pretty common in Latin America. Um, it's caused by, by this bug. It's called the assassin bug or the kissing bug. And it tends to bite people at night, usually around the face. Um, it deposits a, a little protozoa, a little microorganism uh, in their blood. And over a, a period of years, people will develop um, heart failure um, from this disease preventable and very t closely tied with poverty. The bug gets into people's houses and bites them at night. Wow. So if you had a house that didn't have a dirt floor and that had screens on the windows, you would be protected from, uh, from Chagas disease. Well, we're all interested in doing something on behalf of the world's most forgotten. Um, and I like to keep things very, very basic. Um, let's focus on, on three areas. Let's focus on Increasing life expectancy, increasing literacy, and increasing economic development. The, the three are synergistic. And so we can't just talk about literacy alone, for example. Promote literacy, economic development. Well, Lonnie Ackerman is, uh, is an example of this in, in action. So she is a, a family doctor from, from Texas who moved her family to Nepal, uh, just north of India. And, you know, you think of a, of a young family doctor moving to a place like Nepal, what would you expect her to do? Okay, give vaccines, help the people. Okay, teach them health care, you know, start seeing patients, right? Which is exactly what she didn't do. Right. So she was taking a much more uh, inclusive global approach. First thing she did was she started a school for young girls. What? A school for young girls? Wait a minute. Because she realized that education 
is the, the fundamental cornerstone of, of health. And that if girls can learn to read, then it's going to improve their lives by all the parameters that we've uh, already explored. Well, her, over the years, her girls started to grow. They started to graduate. And then they needed jobs. And so Dr. Ackerman started a Votech, a, a Votech school to teach them some trades that they could actually use for, for earning an income. Now, she did see a few, a few sick people, but she always did it in association with a Nepalese person, you know, showing them how to do it themselves, passing on, passing on her skills. Uh, a lot of nations use community health workers. Uh, sometimes they're called village health workers or health promoters. And essentially, they're paramedics uh, by our standards, but they can't afford doctors. Instead, they are uh, just putting the most basic healthcare skills in the hands of some national people. Now, they're all normally expected to do th these kind of things, except one. Yeah, it's D. Not to be anti-intellectual, but, but what we found is if you give them too much training, they tend to leave their community and go to the city and try to make money. Um, and so choosing people that are, are tightly integrated into their communities is, is most important. What can you do to serve the world most forgotten? There was, there was a time in your life, and hopefully there still is, when you dreamed big. You wanted to do something really significant on behalf of people who would not be um, attended to otherwise. Uh, we worked with a, a physical therapist at the Institute for International Medicine, and, and she had this dream of caring for disabled children in India. And um, so we arranged for her to go and work, work among them. You know, I grew more confident in crossing the divides of culture and assuring in my convictions to provide care for people in greatest need. It was a dream come true for her to actually act upon those dreams that she had. Uh, there may be some skills that you need. You know, some of you are, are here because you're trying to improve your understanding of culture, of language, of, uh, of interpersonal skills of order, leadership of organizations. Um, sometimes, and, and especially the, the, the cross-cultural skills are, are the most important. Uh, when I lived in China, I, I would have a real hard time talking with people. Uh, I would look at them and they wouldn't look at me. You know, and I'd say, uh, do I have your attention? You know, and they'd be like, and I thought to myself, you know, they are so aloof, they are so disrespectful, they are so inattentive. Well, finally, someone pointed out to me that, no, that's how they show respect. You, know, you, you look at someone that you don't respect, but you look away from someone that you don't respect. Oh, okay. Cultural insights. Um, Maggie Higgins was one of our students who was in, who was in Haiti during the, uh, during the earthquake and, and got m more of an education than she ever expected. You know, most importantly, to see such pain and death and yet keep giving it my all. And then there may be things that hold you back. Uh, when I talk to young people in particular about taking a risk on behalf of the world's forgotten people, they usually say things like, oh, I have all kinds of reasons why. Uh, I don't know about those diseases. Well, you're a smart person. You can learn. Now, I might get sued. Well, it does occasionally happen, but it's very, very rare. Uh, you can buy liability insurance. Isn't it dangerous? What's the leading cause of death of Americans in poor countries? Kidnapping? <laughs> I hope not, but yeah. Homesickness, Homesickness. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Homesickness. Well, it's not yellow fever. You know, you always get your yellow fever vaccine, but that's not what's going to kill you. Um, it's actually a, a motor vehicle accident. So stay out of those brightly colored taxis and minibuses, you know, that's where the death occurs. Um, I don't speak a language. Well, but sometime in your past, you, you learned a language. Now, I, I failed high school French. I thought, oh man, I'll never be able to work in another culture. But language learning is mostly about motivation. You need a reason to learn a language. And Frankly, there was no reason for a white guy in Kansas City to learn to speak French. There was no one to speak to. 
Uh, and so once I got on, on location in China or in Angola, I had a really good reason to learn language and um, found that it wasn't quite so impossible. Uh, English is, of course, the most useful language, but if you're going to become part of, a, of another culture, um, their values are usually very tightly encased within their language. And so as you learn one, uh, the other comes along. Uh, I don't understand cultures. Well, you all are here because you're intrigued with cultures and intrigued with getting to know people. There's nothing that is more uh, educational for our own understanding of our own culture than seeing it through the eyes of people that have a, a different background than us. Um, I can't afford it. You know, I, I've got to have enough money to pay my loans, to care for my children. Well, it's true. No good deed goes unpunished. If you want to care for the world's poor, it's going to cost you something. You are not going to make as much money as you are otherwise. But you have to say 50 years from now, what's really going to matter? What do I want to look back on with my life? Um, and with that indebtedness that so many students um, are burdened by, there are some things you can do. You can minimize your loans. You can live simply, you know, continue to live as a grad student. Most of you haven't starved yet. My parents won't approve. You know, your parents want you to be successful. They want you to. And if, and if you say, no, I'm going to be a social worker. No, I'm going to work with uh, refugees uh, in southern Illinois. Um, I'm going to go work in India and take care of the homeless. They won't approve. You know, protect your child from harm. Parenting 101 but they will be really, really proud of you. <laughs> and they'll boast to their friends about what great things their children are doing. What about your children? Will they be deprived? No, they won't be deprived. Take them with you. They'll grow up maybe in another culture, speaking another language, understanding people that are very different from themselves. What a beautiful education. Uh, I'm not a spiritual person. You know, often people that are engaged in this kind of work have a, a strong spiritual motivation. You know, not always, but, but often that's the case. Um, you know, the Good Samaritan account, I think many of you are familiar with, uh, it was a foreigner coming to the aid of someone very, very different, culturally, linguistically, geographically, and providing ca care for that person. I can't make any difference. So what if I invest myself on behalf of the world's most forgotten? There are still millions of other people. Um, we work at the Baptist Medical Center in northern Ghana as, as one of our sites. And uh, one of our students, Erica, said, I saw so many children die from malaria and pneumonia, dehydration, often five or six kids dying every day. We worked so hard to try and save them, giving fluids and medications. And often I saw a child who at first I was convinced would surely die look up at me the next day with a smile. What could possibly be more rewarding? So you may not save the world, but you certainly will have some impact on uh, a few individuals. Um, as I begin to wrap up here, Mark Byler uh, is a, a friend of mine who has uh, spent the last 15 years living in Zimbabwe, uh, the worst quality of life status in the entire world. Most of his patients have, uh, have HIV. Um, what's going on in this picture? They seem to be falling so frequently that they actually built a hospital at the bottom of the hill to take care of them, right? Well, in, in, I would like you to think a moment. I'm, I'm going to ask you a question to, to share something that you've been involved with to help the world's most impoverished people. Maybe you were a coach, maybe you were a teacher, maybe you were involved in some kind of community development organization, and I'm just gonna ask you to, to share an account of, uh, of some way that you have been serving the world's most forgotten in, in, here in a moment. Um, Frodo, um, who won't play, uh, is saying that, I can't do this, Sam. It's too hard, and Sam says, We've got to. We've come this far. We can't turn back. What will you do on behalf of the world's most forgotten people? Um, 
throughout recent history, there have been role models. You know, people in the media, we think of, of Mother Teresa, or maybe Bill Gates, uh, Bono, people that are, are taking steps to highlight the, the world's most forgotten. I'm really inspired to be around uh, people that are still in, in their educational process that have these kind of, of values as well. Uh, one of the things that, that we do for people in, in education is we have a diploma in international public health. Uh, it involves a, a course of study that covers topics like these. Um, and then we send our students to work in a developing country with a mentor, uh, usually for a month or two at a time, for a chance for them to, to see how community development, public health can be done in, in this kind of context. Uh, we don't send large groups. We usually send students one or two at a time so that they have that, that interaction with their mentor on location. And then we recognize them with a diploma in international public health. Um, caring for people on the margins of society is tough. Uh, it demands everything we've got. And many people in the process begin to feel like maybe they made a bad decision. Um, it's too hard. People are not grateful. I'm in too much debt. Uh, my parents don't approve. And yet, doing something on behalf of the world's most forgotten is a way of, of not only aiding them, but also aiding ourselves. It helps to develop within us a sense of humility and kindness and thankfulness, gratefulness for the blessings that we enjoy as we move into uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, and so I, as I close, I want to give you a chance to share an account of some experience of this nature that you've had. Please. That's wonderful. Thank you. Another account. I want to ask a question. Yes, please. Uh, maybe uh, what you just seen thing soon. All right. How will you deal with uh, typically framing or defining meaning? People usually mix politics and wars and agendas and so forth with so good Samaritan thing. Mm -hmm. So if you are like an American, Yes. So, how would you break the ice and say, no, 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 I'm, I'm not following that, I'm here differently? Yeah, so how can we, as, uh, as Americans, be engaged in, in other countries where, where the people may have some, some very legitimate suspicion of, of our motives? And I think one way to do that is to uh, be very, is to have a local host. You know, be invited by someone who uh, is of that culture that can introduce you, that can guide you in, um, in your interactions with those people, uh, help you avoid some of the cultural mistakes that, uh, that you may make, and give it time. It won't happen the first week. It may not happen the first year. And so long-term investment into these kind of, of relationships is, is uh, extremely important. So give it time and have a local host. Yeah, you're, you're telling this, the story of uh, Jim Elliott, um, was a, a prominent American uh, working in Ecuador who was, uh, who was killed. And, uh, and yet the people who, who killed him out of suspicion um, eventually became friends with his son and with his wife, Elizabeth Elliott, who is a, a, a very popular speaker in the United States now. And that was 50 years ago. And, and so he died, but yet his associates continued to develop this relationship with the people who had killed him. Uh, and it became a, a beautiful resolution. Just have a comment. Yes. Maybe based on the charts that you show about different countries and the relation between poverty, education, access to public health. I grew up in Argentina. I lived there until I was 25. And Argentina we have public Really good health system. When 
when I um, moved from Argentina here, one of my biggest disappointments is our system. Yes. Everything else was outstanding. Education, the economy. But going to the clinic of a hospital, I was pretty bad with people. The time that the doctor was spending with me, uh, I didn't feel the doctor was trying to get to know me as a person. Mm -hmm. Also, the amount of paperwork and uh, the filing of things and the cost yes. of health. And I yeah. know I'm a professor here. I can afford going to a doctor or going to the dentist, but I know I know people can. Yes. So in America, one of the richest um, countries in the world, and our health system is suffering for that ability to actually go to the dentist mm -hmm. or go to the dentist. I kind of want to have your thoughts on that. You can do that. Yeah, yeah. Can you so hold on just a second? Another question would be, are, are there missions like this in, in America? Are they um, like free um, you know, services provided to mm -hmm. people in need or for both in America? Yes. Well, quickly, a uh, critique of the United States health system. It is a mess. Um, some people say we have the best health system. Well, we have the best health system in terms of, of technology and specialists. But in terms of people's access to that and their ability to pay for it, we have a long way to go. Canada is far, far ahead of us. Um, you know, health, health Canadians get the same sort of health care we do, and it costs them one-tenth as much uh, as we spend. And so, so uh, I don't agree with everything under the new health care plan, but it's probably better than what we had before. We have to do something because the current system is, is not working. Yeah, it, it is a tragedy. We live among such wealth. Yes? Um, so, to share my experience, I think my default thing is only extended to doing the microloans. The, yeah. the microloans where you give a small amount of money, uh, your income, but it's a great starting capital for entrepreneurs in developing countries mm -hmm. to help them get their business started to improve their economic uh, situation. Right. And I want to share a story that I heard from my colleague who is from uh, Minnesota. So in Minnesota, they have a large Somali settle, uh, um, refugee settlement uh, in Somali, from Somali. And there was a big issue on access to healthcare yes. because of cultural barriers. Mm -hmm. So the healthcare is available, but the refugees would not go to the clinics mm -hmm. because they don't know the language, they don't have cars, they don't know how to ride a bus, they don't speak the language, they don't trust the doctors. So the, my colleague was an uh, uh, instructor in nursing. And so she organized a community service project where she would bring the students to the homes of the Somali refugees. And then slowly, through a few years, they have developed a relationship with the people. And they can now actually take vitals of mm -hmm. the children. So the people will actually let them you know, measure the weight and the blood pressure. And just very simple thing that we take for granted that is such a barrier. I mean, they're living in America, right. but they have no access to anything that we could offer. Mm -hmm. So I think those kind of community partnerships can be so useful. Yes. Excellent. Thank, thank you for sharing that story, because it, it highlights some of that, that cultural misunderstanding and the fact that it takes time and a relationship in order to, to cross those, those barriers. Do you have a question? Yes, please. Um, I know of some development agencies that tend to empower local communities in African countries. For instance, you would have women given access to uh, medication where they would buy this, they would have like a pharmacy where the rural area people go to that woman to get medication. Can you give me examples that you might have from your 
that uh, empowers mm -hmm. the local people yes. so that there is sustainability mm -hmm. when the, the experts leave. Yes, how can we help to empower people to, to care for themselves? Well, in brief, I would say two things. Um, first of all is through your own example. The power of exemplary role models you know, can, be, can be very uh, impressive upon, among young people. And then, and then the second is those of you who want to teach your skill, want to, to start something like a, a mi microfinance project, but, but do it under the leadership of a, of a local person who has the potential to continue that following your, your departure or the development of that project is, is, is very important. I, those of you who are involved in, in teaching your skills, I think, have a, a wonderful gift. How about just one last comment before we break for lunch? How you fund it? I know money is involved in your work, so uh, you have your source, but yeah. how you fund it? You know, right. How do, you, how do you fund this kind of work? Okay. Yeah, the, the institute functions like a small university. Our, our students pay a tuition. Um, but we also find that, that uh, organizations tend to be rather soft-hearted when it comes to global health and are willing to support the students and to, to support this kind of work. Well, so, yeah, please. Uh, you mentioned uh, medical, is, I think your phrase was the medical phenomenon and you said right. rather controversial in some senses uh, mm -hmm. although you identified some, some good why is there controversy about these medical missions uh, yeah five five thousand a year did you say right the right yeah the, the controversy surrounding surrounding medical missions has to do with with long long-term impact I, I don't throw water on it I don't intend to throw water on it it's it's people who are motivated out of wanting to do great good um, Part of the criticism comes from the fact that, that it's so short term that people in impoverished communities usually need some continuity. They need some continuity of care. And so a bunch of foreigners who drop in for a week is not an answer to continuity. And so um, to address that problem, what, what, what the insightful teams are doing is partnering up with someone who is providing continuity in that community and just coming to supplement them. Uh, in order to build to build it, um, an, another criticism is that it tends to focus on caring for diseases that um, is very episodic. We can treat someone's malaria in five days, but we can't treat their diabetes or their hypertension, um, which requires that long-term solution to um, have an impact. Well, to, to wrap up, let me just say this: the the concepts that we have talked about today are really concepts of the heart. It's concepts of, of applying a spirit of generosity and caring for the world's forgotten people. And you can apply that anywhere. You can apply that in urban St. Louis. You can apply that in rural Iowa. You can apply that in Bangladesh. And so my desire for you is that you would uh, do something bold on their behalf.